This old Remington shotgun has lots of problems, but they're all repairable. Let me show you how. It's a model 1900 side-by-side, -side, made about 1904, and has seen better days. Collectors refer to this as a KED grade. The K refers to the basic grade, the E indicates it has automatic ejectors, and the D refers to the Damascus barrels, KED grade. We call this a numbers matching gun, which means the serial numbers on the barrels, receiver, forend, and many of the small parts all match. These guns were hand fit during the manufacturing process and the serial numbers on the parts kept them together. During my initial inspection, I discovered several problems. The forend won't stay attached. The barrels are off the face, which means they aren't tight against the receiver. Also, one of the automatic ejectors doesn't work. It's problems like these that let you know this gun saw a lot of hard use. The first problem to fix is the forend latch. It's a small spring that secures the forend to the barrels and is referred to as a baker style latch. Taking the forend wood off another Remington 1900, it's easy to see how the latch works. Pretty clever idea that was patented in the 1880s. I start by disassembling the forend. The wood is held to the iron by two screws and a single cross pin retains the latch. The pin is driven out with a small punch using a bench block for support. Since I have an original latch to copy, it functions as a pattern. I have a piece of 3 16th inch spring steel flat stock which closely matches the thickness of the original latch. First, I need to determine the size of the cross pin hole. The pin itself is about 105 thousandths. A number 35 drill is 110 thousandths, which is just large enough to let the latch spring rotate freely. After coating the steel with dicom, I scribe the approximate width of the latch spring and the location of the cross pin hole. An automatic center punch is used to mark the location of the hole. After center drilling, I follow with the number 35 drill. Next, I saw out the rough latch spring. Now it's a pretty simple matter to file and forge the steel to the correct shape. I use a 10 inch second cut hand file to remove the bulk of the material and establish the correct width. The next step is to forge the front end a little wider. A torch is used to heat the metal red hot and a 24 ounce hammer provides enough power to upset the metal. After letting it cool, you can see that we have the basic shape. Now I begin to file the latch to the correct taper. Once this is established, the next step is to shape the curve. I have a small shop made fixture that would duplicate the original shape. Heat and careful use of a big hammer forms the curve. The new latch spring is still rough and oversized, but a bit of filing will bring it to the final shape.
Once all the shaping is complete, I cut it to the correct length. Then, install the new latch to make sure it holds the fore end iron securely. It snaps right on. Next, I'll polish the spring with a selection of abrasive paper, finishing with 320 grit. A small file is used as a backer. All polishing must be done lengthwise. Any marks that go across the spring may cause it to break at that point. The latch still needs to be hardened and tempered. For hardening, I heat the spring red hot, then quickly dunk it in quenching oil. Oil is used rather than water, as water will cool the part too quickly and may cause it to crack. It's now glass hard, so I need to temper it, which will remove some of the brittleness. But before the spring is tempered, I need to remove the scale created during the hardening process. It's pretty easy to temper the spring in niter bluing salts. The salts are brought to about 600 degrees and the latch submerged. Once the steel turns a nice blue color, it's dunked in water. Now we have a genuine working spring with a finished look. The finished latch is reinstalled in the forend iron and the iron snapped back on. With the forend latch complete, the barrels can now be put back on face. They should fit tightly against the face of the breech and have a slight gap about the thickness of a piece of paper at the bottom. This William Cashmore double, made in England, is a great example. The barrels are tight against the receiver and a 3,000 feeler gauge will just fit between the bottom of the barrels and the receiver. The latch was repaired first as the fore end iron needs to be attached during this process. As you can see, the barrels of this Remington 1900 are loose. A 6,000 feeler gauge easily slides between the barrels and the receiver. One old gun trader's trick is to put a small piece of paper or business card in the hook. This will temporarily tighten up the gun, but after a few cycles of opening and closing, the barrels will be loose again. It's something to be on the lookout for if you're inspecting an old gun. Another trick is to upset or peen some metal on the hook. This is a sure sign of an amateur repair and won't keep the gun tight for long. There are several correct ways to put the barrels back on face. On some guns, a new oversized hinge pin can be installed and the hook on the barrels fit to the new pin. Another technique is to weld up the hook and refit it to the existing hinge pin. In addition, the Brits used a process called shimming the hook, in which a piece of steel was dovetailed into the hook and the barrels refit. I'm going to use a variation of shimming the hook using a bit of modern technology. A couple of things the old time gunsmiths didn't have were modern adhesives and ultra thin steel shim stock. I'll glue the appropriate thickness of shim stock to the hook using 680 green Loctite. Then I'll smoke the barrels back in, just like it's been done for over a hundred years. Before starting, I need to true up the face of the receiver. This gun has a small burr at the corner, which is easily removed with a fine stone.
I also polish the back of the barrels, removing the light pitting. It's important to do this step first before the barrels are put back on face. Abrasive paper around a file will do the job nicely. I'm careful to keep the file flat against the back of the barrels. I only need to use 400 grit paper as any finer polish would be ruined when I fit the barrels to the receiver. Once I've cleaned up the breech ends, the barrels and fore end iron are reattached. Even with cleaning up the breech and polishing the back of the barrels, the 6,000 feeler gauge is still the largest that fits in the gap. I know the barrels need to be set back at least six thousandths and a couple of extra thousandths will give me enough material to fit the barrels. I cut a piece of eight thousandths shim stock, just slightly larger than the hook. Ordinary scissors easily cut this thin material. looks pretty good. Now I degrease both the hook and the shim. 680 green Loctite has a relatively thick consistency and fills any small gaps. With both surfaces coated, a short piece of half inch dowel and a clamp hold the shim tight against the hook until the Loctite cures. Once the Loctite is cured, the excess shim stock is dressed down even with the hook. Notice I've removed the extractors. They should be out when fitting the barrels. Smoke from a small lamp will show how much contact there is between the hook and the hinge pin. We have almost full contact. Smoke on the back of the barrels will show where they are touching the receiver. Now, when I put the barrels on and try to close the action, I can see metal will have to be removed for the gun to close completely. Using a needle file, I carefully remove the high spots. These are indicated by shiny areas where the smoke has rubbed off. The process of smoking and filing is repeated after a few cycles, the barrels are making more contact, but the top lever is still well right of center. The gap at the water table is about 17 thousandths, so plenty of travel remains to bring the barrels down and allow the lever to move closer to center. A bit more work and the barrels fit tight against the receiver, and I have a small gap at the water table. Now, the barrels are back on face. All of the file marks are polished out, starting with 220 grit abrasive paper and finishing with 400. The extractors are reinstalled and I make sure the gun closes with them in place. The last item on the repair list is one of the automatic ejectors. Their purpose is to automatically eject empty shells when the gun is opened. The extractors are located in the barrels and are hit by the ejector hammers in the fore end, which are powered by small V-springs. In this case, the right ejector needs to be repaired. I remove the broken spring during my initial inspection. All the pieces are here, so I've got a pattern to work from. This piece of spring stock closely matches the thickness of the ejector spring. The first step is to bend the metal over double to form the two legs of the spring. Using a torch, I heat it red hot and bend at the mark. The steel should be allowed to cool naturally as cooling it in water would harden it, making shaping difficult. The ejector spring is only about 170 thousandths wide, so I'll have to cut the spring stock down to match the width. It's a simple matter to mark the new spring for the correct width and file to the line. Now I need to taper the legs. The first leg needs to taper from about 50 thousandths all the way to the full thickness of the spring stock 
It also tapers in width down to about 125 thousandths. The second leg is formed the same way. However, there is a little foot on the end that has to be filed in. Keeping the spring attached to the long piece of stock makes holding it in the vise much easier. An 8 inch file makes quick work of it. With the legs tapered and shaped, I cut off the spring. Now we can bend the legs of the spring to match the original and polish out all of the file marks. Here comes the fun part. The spring is heated red hot and quickly dunked in quenching oil. At this point, it's glass hard. I need to temper it, which will allow it to flex and return to its original shape without breaking. First, I remove all of the scale from hardening. The niter bluing salts are heated to about 600 degrees and the spring immersed. Once the steel turns a nice blue color, it's dunked in water. I compress it in a vise to make sure that I have a spring. Now it can be installed in the forend iron and the forend reattached. Once the gun is back together, I test it with some dummy rounds. Works like new.